And so Learn and Seek is used pretty broadly for, for a wide range of applications. Um, one of the most common applications of RNA seq though is what's called differential gene expression, which is a, a way of comparing the expression levels of individual genes under, say, case control conditions. And so we'll just talk briefly about uh, what differential gene expression means. So one of the most frequent use cases of RNA seq is to identify differentially expressed genes between two or more conditions. And so, for example, if you were interested in identifying the targets of a particular transcription factor, one way to do that would be to measure the expression level of every gene in the genome before and after you knock down or knock out that TF. And so suppose in this hypothetical example that you uh, perform 500 RNA-seq assays on different samples within either the wild type or the mutant. And in this particular case, you're looking at one specific gene and you want to ask the question, is this gene differentially expressed between cases and controls? And so the red curve here represents the hypothetical uh, measurement of that gene's expression uh, after knocking down this particular TF. And the blue curve represents the expression level of that gene when in the wild type, so when you didn't knock down the, G the TF. And so here I just want to uh, illustrate the concepts of effect size and significance with respect to differential expression testing. And so here, the effect size could be roughly understood as the uh, sort of the gap between the means of the blue, blue curve versus the red curve. And so a little bit more formally speaking, you could measure effect size is essentially the log fold change here, or in this case will be the log ratio of the expression of a gene in the mutant versus wild type. So in this case, for example, that would come up to something like minus 1.6, which would tell you that there's a significant, there's a drop in the expression level of this target gene. Uh, on the other hand, the notion of statistical significance could be essentially visualized as the overlap between these two curves, the, the blue and the red curve. And so intuitively, uh, the less overlap there is between the, le the red and the blue curve, the more statistical significance you would get from that statistical test. And similarly, if there's more and more overlap between the red and the blue curves, then the statistical significance is, is less. So the p-value would be larger. And so one of the biggest questions that people ask when it comes to differential gene expression testing is basically the question of how many replicates do I need in order to uh, in order to detect differential gene expression when it actually exists. And so the question of how many replicates I need is essentially a question of statistical power. And so we won't really talk about power calculations in this class, but I want to give you a, an intuitive idea about uh, how the number of replicates you need varies with effect, effect size and significance. And so generally speaking, uh, the larger the effect size of a mutation, then the fewer the replicates you need in order to detect that difference, right? And so effect size is, again, it's a calculation of the log ratio of uh, the mean of one curve, for example, the blue curve versus the red curve. And so basically the reason why you need replicates is that within each one of those groups, either the red or the blue group, there's a lot of variation between samples, right? And so the width of those curves for either the red or the blue curve is, is an indication as to how much variability there is within a group. And so Essentially, the role of the replicates is to give you an estimate, an intuitive estimate, as to how wide those two curves are, such that you can then, in turn, estimate both the overlap between the curves and the difference in the means. And so when those two curves are very far apart, so when the effect size is large, then to tell that those two curves are different, you need fewer samples, because even if each individual group has large variability, if their means are really far apart, then you only need a few samples to really identify that intuitively. And similarly, 
Uh, with respect to statistical significance, essentially the more statistically significant uh, two, uh, two distributions are, right? So the more statistically significant the differential expression is, then the fewer the samples you need. Because essentially, as I mentioned, statistical significance can be roughly visualized as the overlap between these two curves, the red curve and the blue curve. And so uh, if the difference is very significant, that means that the curves or the histograms, for example, they don't really overlap, which basically means that the variability within each group, either within the red or within the red, or sorry, within the red or within the blue group, is small relative to the difference between the red and the blue curve. And so, again, the um, more statistical significance there is underlying the test, that essentially means that the widths of the curves are smaller and smaller, which it in turn means that you need fewer samples in order to detect that difference. And so throughout this course, I've tried to make the point that regardless of which genomic assay you're looking at, in terms of the downstream analysis of the results of those assays, batch effects can play a huge role in terms of driving variation between samples. And if you don't address them, then they can cause um, significant changes in your conclusion of your study. And so here's an example of a fairly well-known paper now where the authors of the study basically did RNA sequencing on a number of different cell types and tissues in human and mouse. The goal being to basically try to characterize um, whether expression in the same tissue across human and mouse is basically more similar than between two different tissues from the same organism. So either you know, mouse or human, right? And so this PC plot from their paper basically illustrates or visualizes the different RNA-seq samples that were collected in different tissues for human and mouse. And so broadly speaking, the circles represent tissues from human and the triangles represent tissues from mouse. And you can broadly see that the circles kind of cluster together in this visualization and the triangles cluster together in this visualization. And so here they're showing the first three principal components of the expression data. And again, the main point is that the human tissue samples seem to cluster together and the mouse tissues seem to collect, uh, seem to cluster together. And so the broad conclusion of this paper with respect to this figure was that gene expression patterns are more similar among different tissues within the same species than between the same tissues across the two species. And this paper was somewhat controversial in the sense that there are many papers before that studied uh, conservation of gene expression patterns in tissues across organisms, including humans and mouse and other vertebrates. And the broad conclusion that people had made up to that point is that gene expression patterns are pretty highly conserved and so Generally speaking, people thought that the heart expression of human uh, looked more similar to the heart expression of mouse than to the, say, liver expression of humans. And so a few days after this paper was formally published, uh, people started digging around the data a little bit more, and they figured out that part of a large part of the reason for this visualization, the reason why humans cluster together and mouse tissues cluster together, it's in large part because most of the human tissues were sequenced in one lab and most of the mouse tissues were sequenced in another lab. And so in some sense, uh, the lab batch effect is almost completely confounded with the species effect that they were interested in. And so once you correct for, for example, lab specific differences in gene expression, then you come to the opposite conclusion, which is that uh, tissue specific expression is more conserved than uh, or expression in the same tissue cross species is more similar than expression across different tissues within the same species. And so the point here is really that um, batch effects are a huge 
factors of variation within many gene expression studies. And so you need to be very careful about batch effects when you design your experimental study. And so just to wrap up uh, the bulk RNA sequencing part of this lecture, um, just like with other types of genomic analyses, uh, you know, this question of which is more important, effect size or significance, also plays a role here. And so when we're talking about, for example, knocking down TFs and then measuring uh, gene expression patterns before and after to identify targets of a TF, um, it's important to distinguish you know, which genes are significantly differentially expressed but have small effect size versus large effect size. And so you know, what is more important here, the effect size or the significance? Um, another important point is that transcriptome profiling is is in large part pretty useful, not just for doing things like differential expression testing between simple cases and controls, but also when you combine it with other technologies that we talked about in this class. So for example, um, you could combine uh, RNA sequencing with not just knocking down a TF or knocking out a TF, but also turning on or off different enhancers uh, to determine, for example, what is the effect of shutting down an enhancer or turning it on uh, as a way of, for example, identifying target genes of an enhancer. Um, and finally, as I, as I pointed out on the last slide, um, in practical terms, uh, a lot of the problems that people spend their time dealing with in RNA-seq analyses is really in trying to find ways to deal with batch effects. 